Our first speaker is someone I'm sure is familiar to many of you, a name that many of you know if you might visit lourockwell.com on a daily basis. But Lou is someone who's known Ron since the 1970s. They've been great friends for years, and they've both been stalwarts of this movement that we all care so much about. So with that, please give a big round of applause to Mr. Lou Rockwell. Jeff, thank you very, Jeff, thanks very much. Uh, I could, of course, take up the entire day today talking about stories about Ron Paul that illustrate what a great man he is. I'll just mention two things about him. First of all, as somebody who's known him for 40 years, you can believe that, I can tell you he's exactly the same man in person as he is in public. And uh, that's not true of the people in Congress, uh, who are very, very different people in private. Um, so it didn't matter when Ron was a congressman, who pressured him to try to do the wrong thing. And I remember one night, uh, we were just the two of us in the office, and uh, there's a call from the White House. It's President Reagan calling. So President Reagan is calling, and I don't want to shock anybody here, to get Ron to spend more. He never called to get him to spend less. It's always to spend more. So in this case, it was for a new bomber, a new uh, device to kill, kill a lot of people. And uh, even Ronald Reagan, as a powerful president, powerful head of the Republican Party, found out that Ron Paul had an untwistable arm. He couldn't be influenced to do the wrong thing. Uh, Newt Gingrich once, uh, in meeting with all the Republicans when Newt was, the evil Newt was speaker, he's, he's telling everybody there's going to be a three-line whip, there's going to be uh, the most pressure, everybody better vote the way the party wanted them to, the party leadership. He said, everybody here has got to do it, or I won't use the language, but uh, you're in deep trouble unless you vote. He said, of course, he said, of course, except Ron Paul. <laughs> so that, uh, that was this man. We're all so thrilled to be here, thrilled that you're here uh, to help celebrate his birthday. Uh, the leader of the freedom movement, the worldwide freedom movement, all over the world, there are young people, especially who are Ron Paulians, who in his two political campaigns especially, became converted to Austrian economics and to libertarianism. Uh, I had some friends in Brazil tell me they thought he could run for president of Brazil and do okay. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is a very great man. And now let me introduce another great man, uh, Dr. Tom Woods, uh, great speaker, great writer, great uh, podcaster, um, one of the extraordinary figures in the libertarian movement. Uh, it's an honor to have him here today. Help me w welcome, please, Dr. Woods. Well, thank you to Lou, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to the Pauls. Thank you to all of you folks coming from 27 states to say happy birthday to Ron Paul. What a statistic that is. Absolutely great. I just want to take a few moments to say something about what this man and his work have meant to me and what his accomplishments have been. Of course, that would take all day. But when I think back to his lasting legacy, just from those presidential campaigns alone, forget about all the books and all the other things he's done, he showed that it's possible to be anti-war without being a leftist. Very significant. He showed that if you want to be free market, you have to be against the Federal Reserve, the giant central planning agency at the heart, anomalously, of a so-called free market economy. And he also showed that you can catch fire simply by telling unpopular truths to audiences of all kinds. We're talking about a man who, standing on a debate stage in Florida, said we should end the embargo with Cuba. N no focus group told him to say that. It's the exact opposite of what any focus group would tell him to say. Or on a debate stage in South Carolina, he stuck by his guns and said, yes, I'm against the war on drugs. Boo, hiss. But he stood by it. You ask him a question, he gives you an answer. This stunned everyone. How's he raising all this money, they demand to know. Maybe there's a connection here. You ask him a question, he gives you the answer. He, he looks right into a hostile crowd and tells them a truth they don't want to hear, but he knows they need to know. And my personal favorite, Ron Paul memory, he was speaking before an Arab-American organization 
And they asked him, well, Dr. Paul, have you prepared a special speech for our organization? Because that's what every candidate does. He goes and gives some special speech pandering to that particular group. And Dr. Paul very matter-of-factly said, no, it's the same speech I give everywhere. <laughs> that's him. Well, I want to just conclude by saying to Dr. Paul, because well, I'm going to introduce another individual to you after I say this to Dr. Paul, but I want to thank you above all for just being a good example in a world where it's so easy to become disillusioned. You have been this shining light for so many of us. I mean, we were cheering you on on that debate stage when Rudy Giuliani was attacking you. And you couldn't have known that there, was, there were millions of us out there who were supporting you, but you were out there saying what needed to be said, and to me, that I can point to you, I can tell my children, I have five girls, two of whom are with me today, I can say, this is a man that you should imitate in terms of integrity and honesty and decency, is a wonderful gift that you've given to me, and I think to all parents and to all Americans, and for that I thank you. However, before we bring up the man of the hour, I have another man to introduce to you who has that job. This is a man we love dearly, and I think you're going to figure out who it is as I begin just describing him to you. The man I'm going to introduce to you now was the youngest life-tenured Superior Court judge in the history of the state of New Jersey. He is senior judicial analyst at the Fox News Channel. And right now, he is distinguished professor of law at Brooklyn Law School, where he is soon to be, and this is no joke, he is soon to be named Thomas Jefferson Professor of Law at Brooklyn Law School. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Paul, Mrs. Paul, uh, uh, Tom Woods, thank you for that introduction. Lou Rockwell, thank and Jeff Deist, thank you for having me here. You know, it's funny how you meet people. I'm going to tell you about two, two coincidences, three coincidences, two ridiculous, one profound. In my work, you never know who you're going to run into. So I walk into the green room, which is a generic phrase for a room right outside of a studio, uh, and who do I see there but former Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. You'll know when this was by what he said to me. So he pops up, and I go to embrace him, and the Mossad, whoever was with him, tried to jump between us, and he pushed them aside. And I said, Mr. Prime Minister, how are you? George Napolitano, this is what the Jewish people want to know. What's he going to ask me? You know, is George Bush exceeding the Constitution? Does the Supreme Court have the final say in its meaning? Is Michael Jackson innocent or is he guilty? <laughs> All right, well, Mr. Prime Minister, I think he is profoundly guilty, but under our system of law, we'll be found not guilty. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of years. I was having a good day. I had a nice time on Fox and Friends. I was zapping the anchors. They didn't know what the heck they were asking me, and I was given all the right answers, and I rushed off to LaGuardia Airport to fly down to D.C. I got there a little early, and I was sitting at the U.S. Air Gate waiting for my flight and to go to DC and I see a Secret Service agent. And the Secret Service agent recognizes me and I recognize him. And before I can say anything to this Secret Service agent, he looks at me and he goes, good morning, Justice Alito. <laughs> well, that's a letdown. Okay, so before I can say to him, I'm not Justice Alito, a voice behind me goes, that's not Justice Alito, that's Judge Napolitano, the other Italian judge from Jersey. <laughs> and let me tell you, it's a long road from Fox News to the Supreme Court of the United States. Thinking to myself, who is this nut job? I turn around and it's Leon Panetta, whom I've never met before. So I said, oh, Mr. Secretary, what are you doing here at LaGuardia Airport with a military jet? You've been out of office for two years now. He says, oh, I'm on a goodwill tour for the Defense Department. I said, I won't tell you the word I used, no way. You're selling your book and you're using government assets with which to do it. And he said, Judge, don't tell anybody. <laughs> now I'm giving a speech 
to about 75 or 100 people. It's a small room and a small group in Alexandria, Virginia. And it's a speech not unlike what you'll hear from Congressman Paul in a few minutes and not unlike what many of you may have heard from me. And I was going through my normal routine about the primacy of the individual over the state and the need for personal liberty in a free society. When just as I used the words Thomas Jefferson, my eyes locked on a man in the audience and his eyes locked on mine. And I, who am sometimes accused of getting paid by the word, was silent. Because the man on whose eyes mine had locked was my hero. And he was right there in the third row of this group. And I didn't know it. It was, of course, Congressman Paul. When, when the speech was over, I rushed down to greet him, and I was instinctually drawn not to shake his hand, but to embrace him. And I embrace him every time I meet him, because he is so filled with goodness that the goodness radiates off you. It's interesting, this concept of goodness. The British philosopher John Dalberg, whom we know as Lord Acton, once said, no good man is a great man, that a good man is one who puts others above self and frequently does the right thing and doesn't even seek credit for it and often does good things for good people and doesn't even acknowledge that he's done so, whereas a great man is someone who bends the public to his will or starts a revolution or changes the course of human events and often uses ungood means to accomplish it. And in his uh, famous collection of essays on human nature and politics, Lord Acton, the one who said power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, also argued that no good man is a great man. Of course, Lord Acton has not met Ron Paul. Earlier today at lunch, he looked at me and, and he said, do you think the revolution will come? And I said, yes, it will. And the person who just asked me that question will be the spark who created it. Why this spark? Why this goodness? Why this combination of greatness? I argue to you that it is two aspects of his character. The first is fidelity to first principles, never wavering in the first principles that everybody in this group embraces, no matter who the critics would be, no matter what the political consequences, and no matter, no matter what the audience wanted to hear. And the second is personal courage. Now, courage is not freedom from fear. Courage is perceiving fear, but moving forward in the face of it anyway for a cause greater than self. And that cause greater than self is the primacy of the individual over the state. The concept that we are gifts and creatures of God Almighty made in his image and likeness, and the trait that we share with him is human freedom. As he is perfectly free, we are perfectly free. Because our freedom comes from our humanity, which is a gift from God. It does not come from the government. Amen. Now. None of that is new to, is, is a new argument to anyone in this room. But you try and make that argument at the Republican caucus of the House of Representatives today. You try to make that argument on the floor of the House of Representatives and you'll have an empty audience. But when you say it with certainty and clarity and courage to the type of people who are in this room, the crowd jumps with delight because you are saying what they know to be true. And they know you are not going to modify the message to please them because your goal is not to please them. It is to educate them. It is to make sure that they who do not discuss human freedom every day 
understand that it is natural, understand that it comes from our humanity, understand that it can't be taken away by the government by a majority vote. You see, the government thinks if they do something by a majority vote, that makes it right. While the tyranny of the majority can be as hateful, as harmful, as hurtful, as destructive as the tyranny of a madman. Our rights are natural to our humanity, and they're not subject to the majority's wishes. If all the world but one believes in something, it would be no more right for the world to silence the one than it would for the one had he the power to silence the world. Boy, sometimes in that campaign of 2008, it seemed like the one was Ron Paul, the one willing to take on the Republican establishment and candidly some of my colleagues at my day job was able to manifest the type of courage that put goosebumps on our arms and tears in our eyes because he is the personification of personal liberty in a free society because he is the godfather I know this isn't New Jersey, forgive me <laughs> the founding father of the liberty movement that we understand today. When I speak to young people, I often like to end with a little bit of, of an emotional zing. And I'll repeat it to you now, though it's not the last words I'm going to say to you. I say this, I expect that when I die, I will do so in my bed, in my bedroom, in my home, surrounded by those who love me, faithful, to first principles. But some of you must be prepared to die in a government prison faithful to first principles. And some of you must be prepared to die in a public square to the sound of the government's trumpets blaring faithful to first principles. When the time comes you will know what to do because freedom lies not in the head but in the heart, in every human heart. But it must do more than just lie there. In the case of Ron Paul, we have the happy warrior of human freedom who has exercised that great bold heart of his exuding that love of humanity and freedom more effectively, more clearly, more articulately than anybody in our era today. He is, quite frankly, for those of us in the liberty movement, not only its creator in the modern era, but the standard against whom all of us measure ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, he is, of course, the creator of this movement. He is, of course, the incarnation, the word made flesh of personal liberty in a free society. And he is the man who proved Lord Acton wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, Congressman Ron Paul. I've ever had. <laughs> There's not much to say after that, but uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, before I get started, I would like to mention that there are a few members uh, of uh, my family here. Uh, first at the table down here, Carol's here with me. <laughs> and my brother Wayne is here. 
there's a, there's a lot more, but I'm not going to go over all the names, <laughs> but I'm going to simplify it. Uh, we have five children, and three, three are here. Lori and Ronnie. Where's the third one? Robert! <laughs> there he is. No, Robert's by, by himself today. His family's in Fort Worth. But if the three would stand up with their families, because a lot of the children and grandchildren, I believe there's a great-grandchild or two here, so uh, they're up, around here. <laughs> But it is indeed uh, very honoring to have so many people come out. And for those who put this together, uh, Lou Rockwell, like he said, I've known him for a few years. He spent a, he spent a couple years uh, in Washington with me. And uh, he and, and uh, Jeff uh, uh, have put this together from the Mises Institute. And uh, I, I thank you very much, Lou, for all the effort for that. Also, Tom, thank you very much. Uh, Tom also works with me in the, uh, uh, you know, homeschooling curriculum and uh, puts a lot of energy into it. And in many ways, Tom, I think the homeschool curriculum is just getting started and it's going to get bigger and have a significance because it's going to be something that's going to be around for a long time. And of course, we do know that nothing happens in government unless we change people's views. And that's the purpose of a homeschool curriculum to educate a new generation uh, in the correct fashion to know about economics and history and, uh, and politic and political philosophy. So I, I consider that very, very important. But uh, most of all, the thank you goes to people like you who have given uh, me and the organization support because without your support, uh, there's no activity. Now, I am uh, sometimes amazed uh, at what has happened. It, in 2007 and 2008, it surprised me as much as it surprised some other people because I didn't have a plan. I didn't say, well, if I do A, B, C, this is going to happen and these are the results. Um, my goals were quite different. My goals uh, in getting into politics uh, were s s strictly to get information out because uh, I was motivated by a particular day. Uh, in history, and uh, guess what day that was? 8 1571, August 15th, 1971, which is an anniversary today, and that was, of course, the breakdown of the Bretton Woods Agreement, which was a pseudo gold standard which was doomed to fail. Austrian free market economists predicted it would fail, and, and, it, and it did. And uh, for that reason, I thought that um, I would speak out on economic issues. So it was a driving force on economic issues, believing that we were in for some bad times. And uh, I recall the uh, event on Monday morning because the announcement came on Sunday night. It was a disastrous announcement. It was a severing gold from the, uh, from the dollar, which meant more inflation. And they were put on a huge tariff and all kinds of problems from that. So I thought this was negative, negative, negative. So I attended a Chamber of Commerce meeting that morning, Monday morning afterwards, uh, and they usually sent messages down from the national office to you know, support or inform or tell people what's going on economically and politically. And they came down and they were all enthused about this particular movement. Uh, and that day, um, the stock market went up the most in one day up until that period of time. So the markets were saying, hey, this is good, and uh, Chamber of Commerce likes it, but uh, I obviously believe there was something wrong. And that is when I thought, well, you know, we're in for big trouble. And it didn't take long after the 1971 announcement for us to be ushered in the age of 1970s was a very bad decade. And of course, all the problems we've had ever since. And, uh, but I used that to speak out. I really didn't expect you know, that I would go to Congress. And that was not too relevant for me. It was to, 
trying to get information out. And uh, 19, so the first time I ran was 1974. 1974, it wasn't hard to get on the ticket as a Republican. You know, at that particular time, there were three Republican uh, members of Congress. Nobody wanted to run. It was a Watergate year, so just a little bit of hand that, oh, I might put my name on the ticket. Uh, they, uh, they, I was welcome to do that. The interesting thing, though, people who know the district here, is that uh, I, that, that was the 22nd district. It included all of Brazoria County in all of Fort Bend County, and still 70% of the district was in Harris County. And of course, uh, the demographics has changed completely. You can practically have a district just in Brazoria County and maybe two districts in Fort Bend County. So this, uh, this was something that was, uh, wasn't, I, I wasn't expected to win the election. I didn't win in 74, but I kept speaking, uh, speaking out. But I do recall, talking it over with Carol because I told her what I wanted to do. And I had a great medical practice. I love medicine and did for a long time. Matter of fact, that's why I went back into medicine after I was in Congress for uh, four terms. And when I told her, I said, this is what I wanted to do just to speak out. And she said, you can't do this. This is a dangerous thing to do. And she says, how can it be danger? I didn't know she knew about the conspiracy theory or not, but, <laughs> but, uh, but she said it was dangerous because you, you might win. Or you no, know, she said you could win or you will win. And I said, no, don't worry about it. Because my message was not to play Santa Claus and say, what do you want? What do you want? And, she's, and she said, I remember very clearly what she said. She said, yeah, but they're going to elect you because they, know, they will know that you're telling the truth. So that is what her perception was at that time. So at that time, I thought my goal ought to be is to, well, I ended up winning a special election, is uh, I won on my terms, what I believed in, and stated as clearly as I could. But people assured me immediately afterwards, especially because it was a small election, special election, they said, don't deceive yourself. The people who voted for you, they don't have the biggest idea what you're all about, and it's just a fluke. So uh, I figured this wouldn't do it so bad. I thought, my job is to vote exactly as I said to see if I'd be reelected. And, uh, of course, it, the, the very first uh, week I was there, I had a lot of grief for voting by myself the first week or so. But I got all the grief, not from the Democrats. It was always from the conservative Republicans that came, and they didn't want me to vote on these basic principles because they didn't want to be, they didn't have it pointed out that they weren't following the Constitution and, and whatnot. But uh, I figured that, uh, no, there's no way I'll get reelected. So I was surprised, and then I thought, well, over the years, I, I left and went back home for 12 years and practiced medicine, and went back in, uh, you know, in 96, uh, one in 96. But I still thought my role, and always did throughout, was to uh, set a record. You know, to say what I believed in, make the documents, put down my dissenting views, and vote, uh, you, you know, so it, someday somebody might look at this and say, you know, he did vote differently and had uh, different principles. But something happened along the road, <laughs> wrong road that changed those things, and that was 200, 2007 and 2008. It was, it was trained, changed dramatically. I mean, I just couldn't believe what was happening. And, uh, and I guess several things happened. One, one was the country was in a lot worse shape because I remember the debate in, in Detroit is uh, when I talked about we were already in a recession and we were in a big recession and got worse and, and people were concerned. So uh, conditions were getting worse. The foreign policy was in, in shambles. The finances uh, were bad. We had an internet. We were spreading messages around the, the country. And people were perking up. But one individual can't do that. One individual's standing up and saying that. It takes more than that. The discovery for me was the greatest thing, that all of a sudden, I'd go to a college campus, and the crowds kept getting larger and larger. But they started not just responding to my suggestions, but shouting out their suggestions. 
When I went to the University of Michigan and I got in to talk a little bit about monetary policy and I was easing my way in because that was a liberal school, you know, up there. And all of a sudden they started shouting, end the Fed, end the Fed. <laughs> And then they started burning Federal Reserve notes. So I knew something big was going on in this country. <laughs> so, uh, but then later on at different campuses, uh, and to me it's very significant. What are the young people thinking? What are they thinking about on campuses? So the, uh, the response, I'd throw out the word Austrian economics. And I'd get applause for Austrian economics on a college campus, a, a state-run university. I thought, what's going on? And then I would mention Mises' name, and you could get an applause. You could get a, I could get an applause from Murray Rothbard. But what really shocked me, what really shocked me is one time I mentioned Lou Rockwell, and I got an applause. <laughs> So I knew the world was changing, and it was changing in a proper fashion. I was uh, tapping into something, but something else was being done, and it was laying the groundwork. As far as I'm concerned, from my personal viewpoint, the groundwork was laid uh, significantly in the 50s, late 40s, early 50s, and uh, for several, quite a few decades, and that was by Leonard Reed at the Foundation for Economic Education. I got to know uh, Leonard Reed, had a lot of admiration for him, and also his techniques of, uh, of teaching. So, uh, and it was through that organization that I met both Hans Sentholz, one of the students of Mises, and also I uh, haven't heard Mises' lecture. So that was very, very significant uh, organization. But the groundwork was being laid, but that was even well before we had the Mises Institute. The Mises Institute started in the early 80s, now that's 35 years ago, and it is significant. That is the difference, because you have to change people's minds in order to change the government. Now, some people get very discouraged because they get involved in politics and say, oh, one voice doesn't mean anything, you can't change anything, and there's too many reasons it's a negative. But the truth is um, that you don't have to worry about the 51%. The 51%, a, a general opinion and endorsement is important, but the important thing is what do the thought leaders of the country believe? That is eight or 10% of the people who are in the universities uh, teaching economics and teaching history. What, what do they think? What are the individuals thinking who write in newspapers and writing articles or now on the internet or do the movies? And there's been a prevailing attitude for nearly 100 years, or at least 100 years, that the attitude has been anti-liberty, consistently anti-liberty, especially since the turn of the last uh, century uh, when you had Woodrow Wilson. You know, we had a bad year in 1913, you know, when you think about, when you think about the introduction of the Federal Reserve and the income tax, that was a bad year for us. So, uh, but also it was that period of time when our foreign policy was changing dramatically from a more of a uh, independent nature to one of, uh, of, uh, of a uh, seeking a uh, empire and going around the world, which has gotten much worse. But the attitude still supported. The prevailing attitude is still predominantly anti-liberty when you go to the universities. But it's changing, it's subtly changing. And if you get the right people in the right places, uh, then the majority will go along. You have to get a, a majority consensus to say that, you know, it is, it's in my best interest to support the people who talk about liberty. Right now, the consensus still is supporting the people who are going to get me more stuff. Well. We're winning that argument because they can't say that anymore. They've run out of stuff to pass out. <laughs> and it's not stuff for poor people. It's not that food stamps for the poor people because they've been victimized by the system. And we certainly recognize that in the last uh, crisis that we had. The crisis came, which was predictable by Austrian economists, just this past week, I, I was on a CNBC show, and they said, nobody predicted the, the, the crisis coming, and I said, well, you just didn't read the Austrian economists. All the Austrian economists uh, knew, knew, it, knew it was coming. So 
with, with the crisis that is coming, uh, what happened when it hit? They went to work, appropriation money, and then what else? The real evil, the real money, came out of the Federal Reserve to the tune of 15 or 16 trillion dollars, and it didn't help the poor people, it didn't help the people keep their mortgages, and the poor people lost their jobs, and now we have more structural unemployment now today than ever before. So the welfare is really for the wealthy, and uh, but the principle is endorsed by the poor. The principle endorsed the idea that the government's responsibility is to take care of us and make us safe and secure. So they give the principle to the government and then the people who really want to be taken care of get behind the control of these principles and they take care of themselves and that's why you have the bankers writing the banking regulations, you have the drug companies writing the drug regulations, you have the insurance company writing the medical regulations and, the, uh, and, and, and capitalizing on this. At the same time, our medical care goes down and the costs go up. And this is the reason that it's the principle that counts. But you have to convince people that it's in their interest. I'm convinced people vote from their bellies. They don't vote from their heart and their brain. They vote from their bellies because they vote for what they think is in their best economic interest. And uh, so far, they've been getting away with it. We've been very wealthy. We have the reserve currency of the world. We keep printing money. People will loan us money forever. And it seems like everybody's being helped. But they're starting to realize that we're in getting to be in worse shape every single day, and we're approaching that day where it won't be just easier for us. It's going to be crucial for us to present our case because there will be people standing by when the conditions get bad, that they're going to come in. The whole idea right now that we have a socialist running and doing well, and the people are responding, you know, for the presidency. This means the people are looking, and somebody else that's running that says, I'll take care of you, I, whatever you want, I'll do, I'll do, and I can do everything and anything. So the people are concerned, but, the big question is, is what are we going to do as a people when a, uh, a, a crisis gets so bad that the economy doesn't function anymore? And that's a possibility. And I think that is what's coming. But I see it as an opportunity because I see groups like this. I go to the college campus, campuses, Young Americans for Liberty. There are many of them here today. They're on the campuses and, and they're waking these people up. And uh, they represent, when I see them and go to their conferences, they're the ones who are responding to this message. And they don't have to be the majority of people on campuses. They have to be just in the position of leadership. And, uh, and this is where the transition is. Just think of all the people who are now, now teaching that went through uh, education with the Mises Institute. Uh, Tom Woods is one of those examples. He started off as a younger person studying and learning and working with the Mises Institute and now doing tremendous work you know, in education. So there's a lot to be optimistic about and not being pessimistic about believing, well, we don't have the 51%, we don't have the votes. The votes will be there, the conditions will, will be there when the prevailing attitude is the right, right one, and that is you're for liberty and not for more big government. And also, we have talked a lot in the past in our campaigns about a revolution. I truly believe a revolution is going on. It's a revolution of ideas, new ideas that uh, are being refined. We don't have to go back to Adam Smith to pick up on the free enterprise system. There's a much better understanding of the 20th century on economic policy and monetary policy, a better understanding what true non-interventionist in foreign affairs is all about. So there's, there's a, a much better understanding than ever before. So there's reason to believe that we can win this. But if we're lackadaisical and apathetic and we don't keep working to change people's mind, yes, it's going to get really rough. It'll be rough anyway. But if, because if you did the right things economically, say in 19, 2008 and 2009, what should have been done is the liquidation of all the mistakes and all the bad debt, all the mail investment, just let it go. Let the bankruptcies flow, and probably in a year we would have gotten over it. 
And uh, eventually that will happen under worse conditions. And because people are always pressured for the politicians uh, uh, to keep bailing, bailing people out. So this, um, this will be, uh, to me, an opportune time. And, uh, and, and this is when we have to present the case that it isn't the government that we need. The government got us into this mess. And most importantly is it is combined with foreign policy. Though I went into Congress initially con concentrating on uh, the economic system and the Federal Reserve and, and other things like that, it's all one thing. And the issue can be boiled down to the issue and the principle of liberty. You know, yesterday, there were some anniversaries going on yesterday. Um, I guess everybody celebrated the uh, 80th anniversary of Social Security. All I can say is it was born when I was born, but uh, Social Security owes a lot of money and I'm out of debt, so I feel better about that. <laughs> Yesterday, also, uh, there was an announcement that uh, after 54 years of us antagonizing and fighting with the Cubans, uh, we actually opened up an embassy, and we should cheer that. But you know, 54 years ago, uh, of course, uh, from our viewpoint, the American point of view, it was uh, you know a disaster. Our dictator was being tossed out, and the Cubans were going to pick up their pick their own dictator. So uh, you know that was that was really the issue uh, that was thrown out the dictator we had in power so, for so long. So now there's a good chance that we can move in the right direction there. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have a long way to go in changing the attitude because whether it's economic opinion or whether it's foreign policy opinion or monetary opinion, it isn't Republican versus Democrats. Those ideas are pervasive in post party. So the revolution in ideas will change the ideas that will affect everybody in government. So you don't see any difference between foreign policy when you have a Democrat or a Republican. You don't have a difference in, in the Federal Reserve. So uh, we have to change those attitudes. And quite frankly, I think it's impossible to have a sound economy unless you have no Federal Reserve at all. So we, um, we face this, uh, th these conditions, I think, hopefully. Yesterday was also a day that uh, I decided to celebrate something special for myself, and that was um, we celebrated the fact that uh, I, have a, I have a tree, and I think we had a picture of that up here a little while ago, a little tree uh, a couple hundred years old in my front yard, and uh, I've decided to call it my liberty tree. <laughs> And um, it, it, interestingly enough, yesterday, August 14th, uh, 1765, 250 years ago to the date, was the date that the colonists had their first uh, uh, blatant insurrection against the British because they were really annoyed by the Stamp Act. And they went to the town square and uh, under the Liberty Tree, which was uh, uh, on the square, everybody knew about it, and the Sons of Liberty met there. And they, the people who were cooperating with the British and collecting the tariffs and all the, all the fees on the stamps uh, were very, very annoyed. So they burnt the, uh, the individuals involved in effigy in that particular tree. But that led to, you know, the Tea Party and the uh, many acts that the government, the, the British government, placed on the colonists. And finally, um, finally, they uh, the war breaks out, uh, and um, and they have they have the the Battle of Concord and, and the Battle of, of Lexington in, in 1775. But that was 10 years after uh, this first incident occurred. And during that time, uh, of course, people became very annoyed with Samuel Adams and others to be so brash as to meet in the town square and talk about getting rid of the tyrants and the king, and they wanted uh, their independence. So the one thing that they did out of spite was they went and 
cut down the tree. The tree was already a very old, well-known tree, but they went and cut it down just out of spite, and then they took it and used it as firewood just to punish the colonists. But guess what? That didn't diminish the spirit <laughs> of the Sons of Liberty. That just uh, provoked them to go much further uh, in, in, into, into the revolution. But, uh, you know, there was uh, that whole history, I think... Uh, uh, was well portrayed in the movie Johnny Tremaine. And um, I wanted to see if I can remember a little bit of a quote from General Gates. Uh, after, after Concord and Lexington, which was victorious for the colonists, uh, they, were, uh, they were so pleased, but the General, General Gates, was the, he was the general that lost it. And he was uh, making a statement, of course, this is in a movie, what he said. Uh, he said, you know, tonight, uh, 10,000, soon, two times 10,000, 20,000 people will come. And uh, he said that uh, tonight we were, we were not defeated by an army or just a, just a, a, a misfortune in war. That is not what happened. And he said that uh, we were vanquished by an idea. And the idea, of course, was the belief in liberty. And that is, that is what is so necessary, to have a belief in what liberty is all about. And if, if we do, we will not be vanquished. Uh, it, but he was convinced that, of course, that it was the colonists' uh, belief in liberty that uh, was so important. But it is important that we understand exactly what liberty means. I am so enthused about the reception on college campuses trying to explain what personal liberty is all about. And it's not personal liberty for some people on their personal habits and some people for their personal liberties on the economic system. Liberty is liberty, and as the judge stated so clearly, liberty is individual, it comes from our creator, that means you have a right to your life, you have a right to your liberty, and you have the right to the fruits of your labor, and you get to use it as you see fit. But liberty brings people together. They're not divisive. Uh, current politics is divisive because they're dividing up power. Not ideas. They all believe in intervention and planning and big government. As if they're dividing up, up power. But true liberty brings people together because it becomes non-judgmental. We don't judge other people. We generally recognize that all of us have the right to pick and choose our own religious beliefs and our, uh, our, our activities in, in a church. At the, at the same time, uh, if people don't want to go, it, it's okay too. You get to make this choice. The same thing on everything socially. You can make choices, but the most important thing is that you're responsible for the decisions you make. And uh, right now, the government is always protecting us. They have assumed this, uh, this concept that the government is there to protect us and take care of us. That's not the purpose of government. It's not to make us safe and secure in a social fashion or personal fashion or habits fashion or economic fashion. The purpose of government is to protect liberty and let you take care of those problems. And if you do well, you benefit. If you don't do well, you have to suffer the consequences of it and you can't go to the government and say, take care of me. So there's every reason to believe that liberals, conservatives, libertarians, everybody, if you understand this, because somebody might want to use their liberties in a way that offends you. But if the offense is that uh, you're not being hurt by it and only they can suffer from it, they should be allowed to do that. Same way with the others on the left side are generally, they're very offended by the fact that if you had all of the control of your money, you might spend it the wrong way. Not only uh, they would claim that you have to spend it certain ways and they want to control that. But liberty means you have your choices economically, choices in, in social habits, and also if you apply this non-interference on your personal and the personal lives of all people, then we absolutely have the obligation not to interfere in the internal affairs of any other nation.
And I can t tell you with certainty, these views that I express, and the people that I talk to on the campuses are very excited about this. This is why I am encouraged and believe much more so that I'm more optimistic now than I would have been in before 2007 because I was absolutely convinced that I would not even see a hint of this. Do I know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next week and how far along? No, we're going to have a rough time uh, regardless because if the government just walked away in bankruptcy, it's going to take an adjustment. But I'll tell you what, if a totally free society that I talk about actually made me and others a little bit poorer, you know what, I'd still argue the case for liberty, no matter what. But the whole thing is that's irrelevant because if you don't want people to be poor and suffering and no medical care, then, then you have to give up on the policies that we have today because that's what we're, that's what we're getting. So I would say that it's an argument that we should never lose. Argue the case for liberty, and then you're going to argue the case for the greatest prosperity, for the greatest number of people, the largest middle class, and then we have a society where if the goal in society is to have, seek excellence and virtue, that you can do it. It's all your responsibility because that should be the responsibility of individuals and, and, and in, in your life. But if you accept the notion that the government should protect us in a moral way and tell us what our habits should be, or we need the government to redistribute wealth, it can't be done without the taking away of liberty. And that is what's been happening. The greatest threat to our, our country today is not ISIS. It's our United States government and our courts system. <laughs> And if we had this, we probably wouldn't even have heard about ISIS because, believe it or not, the mess that we have over there, us being in 140 countries, we precipitate these problems. But you've heard that story before. I had that little debate with Giuliani. And guess what? Giuliani had to drop out of that race about a month later. <laughs> yeah. But liberty is the answer to our many problems and we have to be determined and easily understood and it, it requires some tolerance because some people will spend their money the way you don't think they should, some people will have social habits you don't think they should, but the rule is you can't hurt anybody, you can't steal and you can't rob and intimidate, you just let people alone and the system will work not perfect, there's always going to be problems, there's always going to be challenges, but I am absolutely convinced if you want a society with the least amount of poor people and the greatest amount of uh, enjoyment and freedom, opt for the liberty that we once cherished so much and right now we are reclaiming. Thank you very much. <laughs>